Hey everyone, it's Jim from Bells and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 24, we're going to take a first look at tubes for the Wilsonton R8 integrated amplifier. Today is the first in a series looking at this amazingly affordable EL34 Class AB or push pull amplifier. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, before we start talking tubes, let's take a quick look at the circuit. Now, a big shout out to A. Patel of Pure Acoustics. Uh, he did a partial teardown of his R8. And I don't mean he took it apart, but he measured, um, he opened it up and he measured the various components and he made a little schematic because there's, there isn't one published online that I can read anyways. So let's just go through it really quickly. Here's your RCA in. This is one channel only we're going to look at. And I've drawn in red here the, um, the AC sine wave, the signal representation. And we'd start with a knot nominal positive phase and then we go to a negative it's just to get us oriented to see how the phase changes through the amplifier and we go into the first tube which is the 6SL7 now when you see two tubes like this that are twin triodes remember there's two tubes in the same envelope they often will draw them separately but actually they're all together same for the 6SN7 this is actually these two tubes should be drawn together. So in we go on the grid, we come off, this is our main um, gain stage, we, we come off the, the plate and the signal inverts when you take the sig signal off the plate. We've also increased the magnitude substantially. This is a nominal gain of 70. Rarely will you, will you you take all the gain available of the tube that would be pushing it right to its end of its parameters. But let's say we got 50 as a gain factor. If we put a millivolt in, we'd get 50 out. So the signal inverts when you take it off the plate. Notice how we're no longer positive, we're negative. We go into the other side of the same tube, we come in on the grid, and the signal is taken off the cathode. So this is a cathode follower stage. What that gives us is no gain but it, it gives us a low impedance signal to drive the next stage. And when you take the signal off the cathode, the, it doesn't invert. It stays in the same phase it went in on the grid. Now this is where it gets interesting because this is a push-pull amplifier. Here we go. We're, these are both the same as we saw coming off the cathode, but we go into the 6SN7, which is not a gain stage. It is a phase inverter or phase splitter. Hopefully I got that terminology right. You'll see what I mean in a minute. When you take a signal off of the plate of the first half of the 6SN7, it inverts. So here we start off positive. And then, oh, there's a little error on the schematic here. He's actually drawn the tube upside down. So this is actually the cathode, and what's shown as the plate is up here. The reason why I know that for a fact is because when you take the signal off of the cathode, it doesn't invert. So now we've got two halves of our audio signal, and look at that. They're basically mirror images. We're, we're on the positive side of the phase here, and we're on the negative side here. And we'll see why that's important in just a moment. From there, we go fairly directly into the input grid of our power tube. Let's call it the EL34. And this tube is going to is going to amplify the negative part of the signal. This tube is going to amplify the positive part. So each tube, when this one is pull pushing, this one's going to be pulling. So they're going to work in like a tag team. And what that does is, first of all, if we only had one EL34, it, it allows us to double the power. And because the tube's not operating full-time, it's only operating on half the signal, it'll stay cooler. So you can drive your tube much closer to its spec, spec limits. Now you might, 
You might think, how the heck do you recombine that signal? Do you do it at the speakers? And that looks complicated and messy. Well, it is. But what it needs is a very special output transformer that's designed to take the two halves and recombine it and send it out as a unified signal. So when the signal going to your loudspeaker is on the push cycle, on the positive side here, your loudspeaker is physically going towards you, is pushing out. And when it's on the negative side of the signal, it's actually be physically pulling back. That's that's all there is to it. That's how it works. That's why it's called a push-pull amplifier. But properly, it's a class AB amplifier. Okay, enough of that. Hopefully I got that description right. If not, somebody is going to comment for sure. Um, so, let's start off with the tubes that came with the amplifier. I thought, I'm going to fire this thing up. I'm going to try the tubes. I chose the cheapest option. The EL34 option, they actually give you 60 bucks back or something like that. I didn't want to have any more Chinese tubes that I spent money on around here. I've got a huge selection of vintage tubes for this amp, so that's why I went with the cheap option. And people who did, um, I'll be able to make some comments about what my experience was. So first off, I turned this thing on and it sounded awful. I thought, well, that's not fair. Let's do a burn-in, 12 hours. I'll check it the next day. It still was awful. I'm not sure I believe in burning in electronics, but I did it anyways. Didn't change anything. Look at, I did some quick measurements of the power tubes. This is the GM of a pair of the EL34s. They're nowhere near matched. These are, but they've got, they would have been on, on opposite sides of the amplifier, so that doesn't help us. Now, with a fixed bias amp, and this is a great fixed bias amp because it, you can adjust the bias and you can do four tubes in four minutes easily, taking your time. It's not necessary to have your power tubes bang on, but it would be nice to have your quad fairly closely matched. Anyways, I thought maybe it's the front end tubes. So I pulled uh, the Russian front end tubes, I replaced it with nice vintage tubes, it still sounded awful. So that was it, I pulled all those tubes, I started fresh, and what I started with was what I'm going to call the budget option. I put an Electro Harmonix EL34 into the power slot, a nice close matched um, quad. I keep a lot of these in stock, I recommend them to a lot of people. Um, and um, they're just a rock solid, good sounding EL34, and they're very inexpensive. They're very affordable, and I love the Electro Harmonix logo. Look at that stylized line. Okay, so you probably got, you're probably picking up a little bit of vacuum. I, I've given up asking people to be quiet when I'm trying to film these things. So I thought if I'm going to put a budget power tube in, let's put a budget 6SL7 in, a GE. Uh, in my opinion, the most underrated, undervalued uh, vintage tubes are the GE tubes. And sure, it's short and pugly, but it's got this beautiful nickel plated plate. And I thought, let's go for the GE. Let's keep the Russian tube. This is a direct equivalent to the 6SN7. This is made by NEVZ. Um, none of those tubes were matched at all. They were really way off. Um, but I have a lot of these in stock, so I brought out a, a matched pair of them. So I actually used the same tube they supplied, but I put a matched pair in. So how did that combination sound? What I'm going to call the budget option. Well, it sounded really good. Bass was good, plus, nice tone. It was slightly forward. It wasn't as well defined, perhaps, as um, the more expensive uh, tube options would be, but I would say it was, it was you know, 90% there. Mid range was very nice. It was clean, clear, and crisp, or the three C's, as I like to call it. it had great presentation. When Eva Cassidy came on in Ain't No Sunshine, Wow, it was like she was in front of me It's in some small club. Treble was very nice. Also clean, clear, and crisp. There was a 
slight pinching of the extension of the highs. When I say extension of the highs, that's how long a note will carry. If you don't know the note carries any further, you wouldn't know that it was pinched. But of course, as, as we'll see, we tried some much nicer and more expensive tubes later on. Detail was good to very good. Soundstage was very nice. Uh, overall, this combination um, with the original tube in place, uh, it was it really brought the amp to life. And I would say I would I would give it a solid A. It was that good. So what did I do next? I thought well. In the preamp section, the 6SL7 really is the key to it. And the reason for that, of course, is it does the main voltage gain. So it's going to have the most opportunity to change the sound. So I dropped in uh, a number of different kinds of Sylvanias. And if, if you think you've seen this too before, you have, because the bad boy looks almost exactly like this. The plate's different, but it's the same era, 19... 40s and 50s. Same bottom foil getter, same waist chrome. So the, I, I have a black plate version, I have a nickel plate version, and I have a Jan or a mil spec version. They're all, I think, the same tube. So what did that do for the sound? Well, the bass tightened up. It was better defined. It was even more forward, though, than the GEs, which I found a little strange, but that's that's what it was. And um, I would say uh, the level of detail improved a little bit over the GEs, and as a result, of course, the soundstage became even nicer. It was already very nice under the GEs, but it got even better. I thought, let's cheat, and we'll put one of the best 6SL7s ever made, in my opinion. And that's made by um, MELZ, or Melts if you want. Moscow Electric Light Company. Um, let's have a close look at that. Uh, these are mil-spec tubes. They're metal-based. Um, these are actually brand... Some sellers will call anything with, you know, good testing numbers new old stock. But take a look at that. The real new tube will have a pristine base and the bottom and the pins will look like they just came out of the carton, which this just did. These are all from the 1950s. There's something magical about tubes, not all tubes, but many tubes that were made, especially Melts in Sylvania, but other manufacturers as well, that were made in the 40s and 50s into the early 60s. There are some lovely tubes from the 60s and 70s. All, there's lovely tubes being even made today, but there was something very magical about this period. I'm not going to go into details. Some episode, maybe we'll, we'll have a big chat up about it. It's well worth looking closely at these plates. They're a shiny black. They're really quite pretty. Uh, sort of peeking out from behind the gettering. And you can recognize the 6SL7 easily because it's a cylinder with either one wing or on both. In the case of, let's grab that. In the case of the GE, you see it's got a wing on both sides. If you can see the wings. There you go. Okay. So what happened when you plug those those Russian melts tubes in. Well, if I hadn't been sitting already, I would have I would have hit the floor. I swear, the difference was that dramatic. Um, the the base tightened up a little bit, and it actually came backwards a bit. It was no longer as forward with the Sylvanias. In fact, I would say if you like your base well forward, if you're a base hound you're going to prefer the Sylvanias or the G's over the Melts tubes. But I really like um, acoustic music, small ensemble of jazz, uh, small ensemble of classical. I still listen to some of the music of my youth, so I still listen to some prog rock. But I love detail in the music, and that's what the, the Melts tubes brought out. And with detail, you get... Um, you get a further improvement to soundstage. The Sylvanias and the G's, the soundstage was absolutely fabulous. And it was even nicer with these tubes. Is there any downside to them? No, I think I think they all presented well. I thought, that's as far as I can go with the electroharmonics. Let's pull out the electroharmonics. 
And let's put in a really high quality L34, uh, which means money, right? <laughs> There's, if, if you want a great EL34, you've got to spend money. So here is a Svetlana. Now, I've got a reissue here in front of you. They, they put the Flying C logo on it. The original Svetlana also had a Flying C logo, and it had, for much of its production run, it actually had the stylized S. Svetlana is a Russian company from St. Petersburg, I believe. Svetlana Electric Devices, Inc. is what they were called. They ceased making these beautiful EL34s. I think the last year of production was 2001. There's the reissue tube uh, made by New Sensor out of New York City. I think New York, New York State, I'm not sure. They own Electro Harmonix. They own uh, Gold Lion today. They're probably one of the largest um, tube manufacturers in the world. And they make good quality tubes. But the reissue is not made in, it's made in Russia, it's not made in the same factory, it's not the same tube. Um, so, what did these sound like? I paired them up initially with the Sylvanias, and the, the bass got even more forward with the Svetlanas. Um, it was still, it was fine. If you like lots of bass, you're going to like that pairing. Um, it was probably a little bit more forward than I like. The the mid-range and treble were very similar to what they had been like with the Electro Harmonix. There were really lots of great presentation. I would say there was a little bit, not only did the bass become a little bit better to find, but the mid-range became a little bit, had a greater clarity as well. The level of detail overall improved with the Svetlana and the Sylvanias. And when I plugged in the melts tubes, it improved even further. Um, the bass came back though, just like it had with the Electro Harmonix. I would say um, the, 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 the melts tubes, um, that the bass is neutral and that the G's, the bass is a bit forward, and the Sylvania's, it's even more forward. The difference between um, the two EL34's as far as bass is concerned is I just think that this, the EL34, the, that the Electro Harmonix's, that they're just a tad weak on the bass side and it's not quite as detailed as the Svetlana's, and I think that was the big difference there. But as you can see, the combination of tubes are changing things around. Now, in this mix, I decided to swap out the phase inverter tube, which is a decent quality 6SN7, a Russian uh, NEVZ. Uh, I actually keep quite a few of these in stock. The supplied tubes were so mismatched. It's not a critical slot for matching, but as uh, Michael Fremer of Stereophile Review uh, famously has said, everything matters. I would qualify by that by saying some things matter a little bit more than others. But everything matters. So I thought, let's let's put in a good quality Sylvania 6SN7 GTA. A nice match pair sitting around. And I think that overall the difference wasn't that significant. But I think the bass tightened up. I also tried um, in that slot a uh, fairly inexpensive, another Pugly tube like the G. In fact, I tried the Raytheon 6SN7 GTBs because they were the same size as, as the Gs, and I was, you know, it's nice to have the same size tubes in the front end. You can have the big power tubes in the back, it just looks better. And these really worked quite well um, in conjunction with the Gs. It would be a good budget option, I think. I think, though, that the main difference with the phase inverter tube is that I put in a ma close match pair and that tightened them up. So whatever is going on in that circuit you really don't want your tubes that different and the the supply tubes are really different. Also um, this is the same tube that was sitting in the center of the amp which is in the power supply filter stage. It's not handling audio and by and large uh, 
the you know the presentation that I'm describing was all done with this, and I thought let's just try let's just try the Sylvania in that slot as well. So I plugged another one in there, and I'm not certain if I heard that much of a difference, but I thought I heard that the bass tightened up a little bit further. Isn't that interesting that the single biggest changes that I'm hearing are all in the bass? Um, now. All of these tubes that we're talking about, other than the original tubes, but this this is a 6SN7. This is a well-respected, fabulous, the Sylvania 6SN7. These are lovely tubes. I specialize in them. I sell a lot of them. The Gs, as I've said, they're, in my opinion, they're vastly underrated tubes, and they're very affordable. The older Sylvanias are fabulous vintage tubes, the 6SN7s, the 6SL7s, and all, I've never met one of these melts tubes that I didn't like uh, with the metal base. The 6SN7 version is just a lovely, lovely pre-tube. Okay, so in coming, coming tube labs, we're going to take a look at more EL34s, more preamp tubes, we're also going to take a look at the power tube options that this amp can take. It can take uh, the KT77, it can take the KT88, it can take the 6550. Those three tubes are all very similar. They're much different tubes than the EL34. And um, we're going to look at them, but we're going to look more at the EL34. And the reason for that is that the amp really is power, its design is really favoring the plate voltage that the EL34 is going to like from what I understand from what I've been reading. But we're going to plug in those other tubes and see if uh, if we can like them as much as we're liking the Sibetlanas. We're going to keep an open mind. I've got a good selection of KT88s and 6550s and there's a lot more tubes that we can plug into the front end as well. Okay. If you've stayed all the way to the end, here's some discount codes. Remember, I've got um, $20 shipping around the world, and if you spend $150 or more after your discount, the shipping's on me. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.